there's a war coming and it could have a massive impact on you. No, 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 I don't mean that kind of war. Rather, I'm talking about the new lending war of 2020, the war of the banks and what it can mean for you as a property investor. Hi, I'm Nero here from Investment Rise, and before I talk about exactly what this lending war is, let's take a trip down memory lane. Let's go back in, in time a, a bit. So in December 2014, APRA, or the Australian uh, Prudential Regulation Authority, started clamping down on banks and how they gave out loans. So put simply, APRA decided that banks were being, well, a little too loose in how they assessed people's ability to uh, borrow money and more importantly pay back the loans and as a result of these uh, looser lending standards property prices were being inflated especially in Sydney and, and, and Melbourne. Now you might recall in late 2014 early 2015 the Sydney and Melbourne uh, markets were like, rising like a rocket right and so APRA decided that in their wisdom well this could have some adverse consequences down the track especially if people are unable to pay back their loans. So they decided to clamp down on, on the banks. And this gradual tightening of lending standards continued. And as a result, property prices fell by 11.4% from July 2017 to January 2019 in Sydney. In Melbourne, prices started falling from about November 2017. Now, if you're wondering, well, hold on Nero, APRA started putting pressure on banks in December 2014, but it took until the middle of 2017 for prices to start dropping? What, what gives? Well, the, the reality is that it only took about a year for these lending restrictions to flow through to the market. So the Sydney and Melbourne markets actually started to go flat in about late 2015. Then the Reserve Bank of Australia decided that, well, they didn't like that very much. They didn't like the fact that the property prices were, were flattening in our two biggest markets, uh, especially with this huge supply of units um, coming online, as you know, lots of developers were going in, going there, and you know, lots and lots of units were, were, were being uh, brought to the market. So they gave us two surprise rate drops in 2016. As a result, this then artificially propped up the market until 2017, when our two biggest cities suffered their biggest price drops in history. Yep, the price falls that Sydney and Melbourne experienced between uh, 2017 to 2019 were bigger than the price drops we had during our last recession. They were bigger than the price drops we had uh, during the GFC. And they're bigger than even uh, what we've experienced during this COVID-19 induced recession. And yet, Nobody in their right mind is going to tell you that prices crashed uh, during that period of time. Now, if you've been following my work for any length of time, you'll know that I was one of the few who warned people that buying property in Sydney and Melbourne from about 2016 or so, especially if they were looking for capital growth in the short to medium term, was a very high risk move. Well, unfortunately today, there are still many people who bought property in Sydney and Melbourne from about 2016 to 2018 who would struggle to sell the property for what they bought it for. Now, what does all this have to do with, with today? Well, in February 2019, the findings of the Royal Commission into the banking industry were handed down. Now, mind you, this Royal Commission cost $70 million of taxpayers' money. And one of the fundamental recommendations was that the lending restrictions in place should not be altered. Okay, so this was a key recommendation of the Royal Commission. And yet, what did our treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, recommend just a couple of weeks ago to the end of September? He said that he will wind back responsible lending laws, making it easier to access credit. So hold on, we have this Royal Commission, uh, we have APRA saying that, look, we need to uh, keep lending restrictions uh, tight uh, and put all the onus of responsibility on, onto the banks. And then what does our, our treasurer do? He comes out and says, well, look, the federal government, we're gonna loosen credit restrictions in an attempt to encourage lending. And this, the responsible lending laws, well, they've become an overly prescriptive, complex, costly, one size fits all regime. In other words, 
we don't really care what the Royal Commission says, we don't think it's appropriate anymore. Okay? Now, conservatively speaking, many industry insiders expect that just this one change will allow the average Australian to borrow an extra $70,000 when buying property. Now, what do you think that's going to do to property prices when someone who doesn't need to earn any more money than they are right now can all of, a, all of a sudden, almost overnight, borrow an extra 70 grand? And that's on average, right? And that's just the start, okay? Because what the Treasurer's recommendation essentially is, is to take the onus of responsibility off the bank and put onto you as the borrower. So even today, mind you, with all the lending restrictions in place, Different banks, if you shop around, you'll find that different banks will lend you different amounts based on how they assess the loan applications. But what happens when banks don't have to play by the current lending restrictions anymore? Can you imagine what they'll do? Well, each bank could easily end up with a completely different lending criteria. And as a result, how much you can borrow will be vastly different from one bank to another. So imagine this. A particular bank wants to increase its profits through lending on property because that's considered very low risk from a bank perspective. And so to do that, what do they need to do? They just need to, in the back end, amend their criteria to make it easier to borrow more. And as long as you, the borrower, are okay with that, and who wouldn't be really to, you know, to, to get either their own home or to buy you know, another investment property, then all of a sudden you've got more credit being pumped into the market. And what do you think that's gonna do for property prices? But banks, you see, are already making a play for more business in the residential lending space. And that makes sense, right? I mean, you, you, you know that banks have already gone through a period where they've had to offer mortgage holidays, and so they're not earning interest on countless millions of dollars worth of loans, right? And now they want to increase their profits again for, for their shareholders. And so what are they doing to increase their business? Well, they're looking to increase their exposure into the residential lending market, right? So some banks, for example, are giving cash incentives if you refinance your loan to them. Mind you, this has been in place since about the middle of um, 2020 anyway, right? And I don't see it necessarily going away anytime soon, especially as the economy starts to, 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 to pick up because banks want the business, all right? Secondly, many banks are lowering their rates outside of the RBA movement, particularly their fixed rates. Now, what does that mean? Well, that allows borrowers to lock in long-term rates at record lows. Who wouldn't want that, whether you're buying your own home or if you're an investor, because then it increases the, the return on your property from a cash flow perspective, or at least makes it cheaper to own an investment property, right? And thirdly, despite the RBA, having interest rates at 0.25% and promising that not to go into negative territory, they're now hinting that they're gonna drop interest rates even further. They're gonna drop it down by 0.15. So they're gonna go from 0.25 that's currently on, they're hinting they'll drop it down to 0.1 as early as November of this year. All those three reasons you can see are gonna really impact on how banks are gonna make it easier for people to borrow money and really then, that sparks property prices to rise. But there's a fourth factor here. And we're yet to feel the full impact of this because it's never been done in Australia's history. But earlier on in 2020, the Reserve Bank of Australia undertook for the very first time a policy known as quantitative easing. And essentially, to give you the bottom line, the RBA gave $50 billion to the banks, free money that they needed to, to lend out. Now, you and I both know that banks make profits from lending their, their money out. They don't make profits from having cash in, in, in the bank or in their, in their coffers. So they have about $50 billion that they want to lend out under these looser lending restrictions. Guess where a lot of that money's gonna end up? You're right, residential real estate. Okay, so let's just recap. Number one, it's almost certainly going to be easier to borrow money than it ever has, especially over the last six years or so, courtesy of our treasurer. Number two, banks are dropping their interest rates outside of the Reserve Bank of Australia movements, especially the longer term rates. Number three, the Reserve Bank is hinting that they'll drop their interest rates as soon as in November. And number four, banks have surplus money that they need to lend out under looser lending restrictions. 
So it certainly seems that we have the RBA, we have our government, federal government, and the banks all teaming up together to prop up the property market. Okay, now, of course, their argument is they're doing it uh, to prop up the, the, the economy, yes, but ultimately, the consequence of all this is that all this extra money is gonna flow into residential real estate. Mind you, we also have unemployment dropping. The September fiscal cliff that so many, I guess, doomsday people were, were talking about, well, we're in October now and nothing's really happened. And already many suburbs in Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Can Canberra, just to name a few, have already started to rise in, in value. And you know, it certainly seems like the seeds of the next property boom have well and truly been sowed. I mean, it's a little wonder many respected economists are now changing their tune and saying, well, we were wrong about prices uh, crashing. We now expect that property prices will rise and rapidly from 2021. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that as a property investor, you can just go and buy anything. There are still certain factors you need to consider, like you know, how quickly can you get your property uh, rented? Yes, vacancy rates are dropping in many areas, but they're still too high um, from my perspective as an investor. So you need to, to check that. Number two, you need to check to see you know, what's the sales uh, volume. Are properties turning over uh, quickly? Because you want to see that properties are turning over quickly. Uh, prices are holding their, their, their value or, or rising. Um, how long is a time on market? Is a time on the market reducing? You want to check these factors. Uh, to give yourself the best chance of, of, of capital uh, growth. And then you also want to check the other factors like the, where the infrastructure is, what's the, the jobs growth in that particular area, etc. Et, et right? So there is some due diligence there. You cannot just go and, and buy something that in an area that you think you might be comfortable uh, uh, with. You are going to find that I believe this next property boom that we are going to have will be very different to the last one. In this property boom, I think what you'll find is that Suburb selection is going to be critical. Some suburbs are going to do really well. Others won't do as well even in the same city. So you can't just say, well, how's the Sydney property market or how's the Melbourne property market? You're going to have to go more granular than that. But it certainly seems that with all these factors, with this new lending war, with banks competing um, with each other to get your business, the seeds of the next property boom, as I said, have been well and truly sowed and it makes a lot of sense for you to start looking for your next investment property and catch this next wave. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you found this video valuable and you're thinking you might like my help to help you find an investment property, then head on over to nerocall.com to discover our unique five-step process that's helped my private client group purchase now well over $66.2 million worth of property. And then if you like what you see, you can book in for a half hour phone consult with me personally. Either way, thanks again for watching.